Passage Theater here at the Mill Hill Playhouse. I just wanted to say a few words that we're, we, uh, outside of our own programming, which you can see behind, uh, behind you, we are very happy to open up the building to the city of Trenton and to events like this for the public. Our current show is Blues in My Soul, The Legacy of Lonnie Johnson, a, lost, uh, a blues artist who has lost the time. You see the set right behind you because we don't have the curtaining to uh, drape it off. Uh, uh, Passage has programming throughout the year, including the merchandise that I'm wearing, which is available for sale downstairs. So if you have any questions, want to see the show, or uh, uh, anything else about the Trenton's professional live theater, uh, please feel to reach out to me um, afterwards. Um, just wanted to say thank you, and here we are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and one more thing. Please silence your phone. And we won't like have any Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Yasmelly Gonzalez, running for city council at large, and I am an educator here in the city of Trenton. Been educating students with disabilities for 20 years now. I'm a lifelong resident and committed to our city. Thank you. And uh, next candidate we have is Crystal Feliciano. Good evening. My name is Crystal Feliciano. I am a native Trentonian. I own home on the island. I'm back out west Trenton. I teach at Trenton Central High School. I have over 25 years of experience in audit and finance. I'm not a politician, but I need the political platform in order to help me to help our city. And I am running for Trenton City Council at large. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Mr. Clifford Anderson. Clifton Anderson. Clifton, Good evening. I'm so sorry. My name is Clifton Anderson. I'm running for city council at large. I am 
property owner here in Trenton. I'm currently the chairman of the Board of Commissioners for the Housing Authority. And I believe that Trenton is a very special place where there is limitless potential where everyone deserves equal access to opportunity, happiness, and a bright future. I'm here to run for council to see to that that Trenton 250 plan is put together, and I'll be grateful if I'm running for council and I have this opportunity to lay that foundation. Next is this uh, Hi, good evening. My name is Jossie Edwards. I'm a lifelong born and raised Trentonian, 34, and a mother of two. Um, both of them attend public school, so, you know, uh, the future of our city is utmost importance so that my daughters and everyone's children have a bright future here that they can prosper and be safe in um, and have clean street and leadership that works together that represents the community properly. Thank you. Um, next is Mr. Kija Manuel. Did I pronounce that properly? Kaja. Kaja. Thank you. Um, my name is Kaja Manuel, and I'm running for Trenton City Council at large in my hometown of Trenton, New Jersey. Um, my story is a bona fide Trenton success story. I'm a young professional with private, federal, and military experience. I understand and know the business model of success and how a thriving town should look. Um, I'm one of the many candidates here today who want to contribute by serving and um, one of the many candidates that believe in the future of Trenton. And when I say that, I mean a future with less violence and more peace, um, a future with less adversity and more hope. So I hope that after the panel, you consider making me one of the candidates that you choose to vote for. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I'm first, correct? Correct. <laughs> um, thank you for that question. So yes, I would say, my neighbors would say that um, I'm an involved and engaged neighbor. Um, I try to um, be inclusive to everyone, um, all nationalities, and just embrace it. the melting pot that we have here in the city of Trenton. I am a co-founder and a vice president of a nonprofit called Trenton United Family Foundation, where we provide and connect people with resources needed to empower and enhance their futures. So I would say I'm extremely, my neighbors would say I'm extremely involved and um, caring, compassionate, and I'm just committed to the city and committed to doing the work that's needed to move Trenton forward. So if my neighbors were to describe um, me and my involvement in the community, they would say that I'm very involved. I have been even before I thought about running for office. Uh, one of my neighbors, Bernard McMullen and I, we actually co-sponsored the March to the Ballot Box event that happened in the city for two years in a row, where we actually got the community together to be civically engaged to understand the importance of getting out to vote and why it is important to be engaged. I have participated in activities where we have fed the homeless, where we have done things to actually benefit the people in the community. I've worked with the former fire director and current, where we work to get smoke detectors included in to people's homes, right, that they would have it, that they would be safe. The list goes on and on. I also have a foundation named after my daughter, the Gianna Monet Genesis Foundation, where we have blessed many children in the community that experience partial or total hair loss due to alopecia, which my daughter has, cancer, and other extenuating circumstances. They would say I'm all in all the time. Thank you.
my neighbor. I visited a church not so long ago, and my neighbor said, this is one of the best neighbors. You're always involved in everything. We, I got involved in feeding the homeless, back to school program. Every program, every holiday, I am putting on program for my community. My neighbors are very excited that I'm involved in this because they said that I'm laying a foundation for the future generation, and they are very happy to see me involved in running for council. If my neighbors were here, all of them, I've lived in many, many neighborhoods in the city, and I've always carried myself the same no matter where I lived at. That's keeping our streets clean, that's looking out for one another, helping out with the seniors that's in the neighborhood, um, keeping the streets safe, advocating for speed bumps. I've helped people, I've helped my own neighborhoods com complete uh, permits for speed bumps. Um, just earlier this year, we lost our 10-month-old puppy to a speeding driver coming down the street off of the highway where we live at on Ferry Street. Um, we were crossing the street already and they just tried to go right past us. So addressing those types of issues, bringing it to the administration's attention to let them know what's going on in their neighborhood and teaching my neighbors how to advocate for themselves too. Don't just complain to each other. The administration can't make these changes if they don't know what's going on. So we have to understand that each and every one of us are their eyes and ears. So we need to report it. Um, they will tell you that I'm very engaged. I'm always involved. I attend civic association meetings to see how I can be a contributing member, how I can be the best neighbor that I can be, you know, learning the ordinances and things like that. So, you know, um, I like to be engaged. I like to be involved. I'm nosy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm nosy. And so are my neighbors. And that's the type of people that we should be. Those nosy neighbors making sure that the trash cans are on the curb when they're supposed to be, making sure they're covered and animals aren't getting to it. Those simple things, recording street lights when they're out, stuff like that, that affects us all. Um, our neighborhood watch, you know, um, we keep cameras up and we help each other report what we see. We have break-ins and things like that that we were able to catch people for. So that's the type of neighbor I am. So you can trust that your house is safe when I'm there. If my neighbors were um, here today, uh, I think they just, well, the ones that do know me, um, Full disclosure, Tom and I just bought a home in Mill Hill this year, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So, but I do know Michelle, I know a few few other of my neighbors here. But I think they describe me as someone who understands time management um, with the many jobs that I do take on. Um, I'm a family guy, guardian to my little brother Trey, who um, has autism. Um, like Jossie, I take care of my neighborhood. I live right on East Front Street, so I'm a stone store away. Y'all, welcome to my hood. Um, we claim it. We're like the redhead step child of Mill Hill because we're, like, we're we're considered Mill Hill, but we're on more downtown, city facing. Um, but yeah, young professional, hardworking. Um, I have my own personal values. I'm also a watcher. I'm one of the neighbors that look out. Um, hopefully, my neighbors don't think I'm a Karen, but I too make sure that the trash cans are pulled back and I sweep. Make sure the bricks aren't lifting up too bad from the trees and then call the city because I'm not trying to get sued and I don't want my neighbors to get sued for the bricks in front of their home. But um, yeah, they describe me as hard working as someone who cares about the community and continues to stand up um, for what's right even when it's unpopular. I think that's important because my leadership and the skills that I have would mean nothing if I'm not willing to stand up for myself. So if I'm not willing to stand up for myself, how can I stand up for those that I'm willing to serve? All right, so um, basically the questions are going to be centered around the four main topics of responsibility for uh, council, which is assessment, confirming uh, appointments by the mayor, reviewing and approving the proposed budgets and monitoring its implementation, uh, investigatory review, leadership management, and constituents communication. But we have some like general questions that came in so we'll just throw those out and um, and start there. Uh, we'll probably not ask 
question. So um, just developing a positive rapport, a respectful relationship with administration, um, as we all know, we've been on a standstill because of personal agendas and personal um, views on things. I think it lacks professionalism. Um, we need to, obviously, we have elected someone to be our mayor and to have that support system around whoever is elected as, as our administrator and executive of the city, um, it is very imperative that we work collaboratively with that person so that way we can move this city forward. We have been at this for too long and it seems like we continue to go uh, in a downward spiral. And so right now we need uh, professional people who will be respectful, who are able to articulate, control their emotions, and be able to work collaboratively with our administration so that we could get positive results for this city. Thank you. So I'm going to skip around with this one because um, I'll ask another question, but the same question um, to Mr. Anderson. The same question. Oh, the same you. question. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just skipping around with it. Okay. The question is, how would that work with the mayor? Uh, with the administration. Or the administration. Yes. The administration is basically the same <coughs> administration as I oversee. I oversee the Trenton Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. I am the chairman of the Board of Commissioners. As the chairman of the Board of Commissioners, I have seven commissioners that I, over, that I worked with. And my director is basically like my mayor. Mm -hmm. The director and I, we develop an open line of communication. So we discuss things, <coughs> then we put it on the agenda, and we work together to achieve the day-to-day -day affair of the organization, which is the most important thing because the director is the one who takes care of the day-to-day -day affair. The mayor is the one who takes care of the city day-to-day -day affair. So we must have an open line of communication, and we must make sure the city work at any means necessary. Okay, so, thank you. Thank you. So for this um, question, I am going to read uh, a response that was provided by Michael Ranallo, and so you can tie me for his two minutes. Okay, thoughts on working with the administration. The function of the council is to be the checks and balances of the administration. This does not mean it requires an adversarial or combative relationship to achieve that end. Council should work cooperatively, professionally, congenially with the administration towards the goal of increasing the real and perceived value of Trenton. This does not imply that the council should be a rubber stamp body, approving every proposal, contract, or item that appears before the body. Every decision made can be tied back to economic development, from hiring a police director who formulates plans to reduce crime, to purchasing new sanitation equipment that will help to keep the city clean, to maintaining the waterworks which will result in higher quality services for the residences and businesses in Trenton. All activities can be impactful to economic development and increasing the real and perceived value of Trenton is the benchmark of a successful administration. My intent is to leave the personalities at the door and make decisions with the cooperation and input of six other individuals whom I all have the best interest of Trenton at heart. Okay. All right, the next question um, will uh, go to Ms. Deliziano. Um, it's another general question. What is council's role to attract business and jobs? And how do you feel about promoting cannabis-related business in our community? Thank you for the question. What is council's role to attract businesses and jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And how do I feel about cannabis-related business in, in, the, in, the, in the community? Right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So council is the checks and balances of the mayor and the administration. The role to attract the businesses would be when the mayor and, and housing and economic development, they look to go and actually bring the businesses into the city. They bring forward the proposals and the ideas. I would say as council, 
we would like to be at the table to hear the ideas and the plans that the businesses would look to do, to be open-minded to the benefits of the city and to ensure that we're bringing in businesses that will better enhance Trenton and its future growth. We want job opportunities for our residents. We want economic um, stability for us. We want businesses that are going to come here and not just be here for the moment because it feels good right now and then leave us high and dry. Right? And so in through having those conversations and working through that collaborative dialogue, holding everyone accountable to that, then we can accomplish that as council. With relation to cannabis-related business in the city, I am not opposed to that because Trenton, we actually would have been able to benefit right, financially from it if we had went ahead and did what it was that was proposed on the table. Now, let me be clear on this. I am an educator, um, and I am a mother, and I am very responsible. I do not support drug sales and dealings in the streets. I do not. However, I do understand that cannabis is a wave of the times. It is a revenue-generating business, and that we could be open to bringing it here responsibly, right, and wisely in order to best help our city thrive. Thank you. Thank you. There's no reason for city council to take over economic development from the city. That was, a, in my opinion, a play for power against the mayor to take that power and control from the administration. Uh, I think that city council simply put needs to just do their due diligence with making sure that each department is doing their jobs, making sure that Trentonians are included, making sure that we are directly benefiting from the decisions that they're making. We don't need to take control of that. We just need to know where our roles and responsibilities are. And, and you said there was another part of the question. Um, it said, or will you rescind that action by the previous council oh, yeah, and why? Definitely, I will rescind it. Because <laughs> let's give the administration a chance. The city council did not give them a fair chance with trying to do anything. And in fact, eight out of 10 things with Trenton Waterworks, for example, was voted down. So we need to just learn how to collaborate, you know, with uh, fellow city council members and collaborate with the administration and just making sure that things are done properly. And that's it. Thank you. And uh, this is the last general question. It's just very, I think everybody can respond to this if they feel like it, but I'm gonna um, uh, give it to Mr. Manuel. Uh, the city is the first. Do you speak Spanish? How will you engage all residents in foster community? That is a really good question. So, um, Trenton is a very diverse city. Um, you know, <coughs> I do not speak Spanish. I am um, one of the half Puerto Ricans who don't speak Spanish. My abuela gets me for that all the time. Um, um, I think the city could uh, strongly benefit from a, a ramped up office of um, either an office of immigrant concerns. We can work on the name, but Trenton's very diverse. We've got people from all over, parts of the Caribbean, some from countries in Africa, some from Europe. Um, we could hire liaisons, create a new department, hire folks from the city to work and become city employees, give individuals who live here, who work here, who have a natural born talent slash gift to communicate with citizens in times and in ways that we can't. Um, as a council person, I don't think it's my job to speak every language under the sun or every language that Trentonians do speak, but it will be my responsibility to make sure that those who do speak different languages and different tongues have access to the same information. Trenton has a really severe accessibility issue when it comes to access of information. If you don't know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, or if you're not electronically savvy, oftentimes you don't have access to that information. And that's a primary concern, especially concerning those who speak a different first language or a second language. Thank you. Um, I'll 
Oh, yeah. I was going to say, do we, uh, was that for everyone? Yeah, yeah. Can you just repeat it one more time? Okay, all right. All right. All right. proud Puerto Rican woman. I do speak um, Spanish and English, um, and I think that um, that is something that we're lacking here in the city of Trenton. We don't have um, the representation of the makeup of the city, um, so I think it's imperative that we may have, you know, one or two people that are able to speak and communicate. Um, as far as fostering um, the diversity that we have here in the city of Trenton, um, I am one to always include everyone. Um, I just recently did an event where we had a Caribbean an African beat, an African beat night, and that was just to include. We often have a regular hip hop or R and B or jazz, and then we often have a Latin night or Latin events, and we never often, you know, include other communities that are here in this makeup. As I said earlier, this is a huge melting pot here in the city of Trenton, and it's all about treating each other as one. Yep. Um, and so I believe um, that we need to include everyone, you know, in the process and in information being uh, sent out. Thank you. Go right ahead. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I do speak Spanish. Um, I teach the students, the, the um, Hispanic students that are in the high school each and every day. And so I, mon I minored in Spanish when I was in college because I thought my, wild, my dream was to marry a Puerto Rican. <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> and so I did, but <laughs> that's a story for another day. Um, as far as reaching the diversity in our city, that is very important. And I would even look to propose that we would have a multicultural board put together, where that way we would have representatives from the different cultures that would sit at the table and they would discuss the needs so that way the people wouldn't feel like they were being ignored or things were falling on deaf ears. So you put together the board, you have them come, they talk, and then we come before it comes to council, the administration, and then we look to see that we are meeting all of the needs for the people. I often say to people, yo estoy una morena, pero yo tengo la corazón para toda la gente. I'm a black woman, but I have the heart for all people, and I'm here to serve everybody. Thank you. I'm from Jamaica. <laughs> Sometimes my African brothers would say, are you from Liberia? Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm a Buffalo soldier. I was born in, I'm from Africa, born in, America, born in Jamaica and raised in America. So I'm a Buffalo soldier. My wife is from Peru. My business, I have hired and leased apartments and business to Latino, all walk of life, different ethnicity. Yes, I believe that there should be a dialogue. There should be a um, multicultural or multi set up for all races where they can go there and get um, information. I remember a couple years ago I did a program at the City Hall and a young lady called me and like, you are the president of the Caribbean African American Legion. I said, yes. She said, oh, I've been looking for somebody from the Caribbean who can understand my dialect. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to speak to them and she like, I feel so much at home. Mm -hmm. nice. It is real important to have organizations to set up where you can identify with when you come to this country with an accent. So I would be 100% supportive of that. Say I'm by Espanol Chiquito. I know enough to get me by forever learning. <clears throat> Um, but I do believe that we should be completely accessible, not just to the resources out in the community, but in language as well, because the biggest barrier is communication, not just the communication that we put out or that we lack, but in language. So, yes. Thank you. All right.
So I'm going to move on first to um, some questions around assessing and confirming appointments by the mayor. And maybe I'll start on this end. <laughs> All right. Okay. What direct experience do you have in evaluation of candidates for paid executive positions and assessment of their qualifications to be successful in such posts? Thank you for that. Um, while I do not have direct experience with hiring at the executive level, I'm new, I'm a baby in my career. I'm a senior level, but I'm not an executive or C-suite. I'm only 32, cut me a little slack. Um, I do have experience with hiring a team and assembling a team for a strategic mission. I was solely responsible at the Trent Health team where I met Michelle and coming up with their mission to get Trentonians the most accessible information um, to make the best data informed decisions regarding their own individual health. That comprised of me hiring, hiring, interviewing, and really searching and going after seven individuals from across this town. I was intentional about staying within Trenton's borders. I always want to give back in any way I can, so I was intentional about hiring seven people, looking at them from the whole person perspective and really seeing how the city could benefit from. I think um, something I tell my team, um, I, FYI, I work at with them. It's a private accounting firm. I'm assigned to the Princeton office. I lead their community impact work, and we call it employer of choice initiatives. And that relates to my role as council, hopefully, if I'm one of the few to be elected uh, in this position, because my nine to five, I look at how can we be an employer of choice? And through that lens, I can bring to Trenton, how can we be a destination of choice? What do we have that neighboring towns do not have? And through that process, I look at them from a whole perspective, and it always boils down to opportunity. Opportunity both on both ends, because something I realized early on in my career, prior to going corporate and military, uh, the opportunities we take and the opportunities we give is what really make our career. You never know when that person's gonna come back around and just go in after diversity uh, conferences past summer, thank you. Um, I realized that, so it's all about opportunity, making sure that Trenton is Trenton, when I say Trenton, I mean the taxpayers and uh, the homeowners or property owners um, are on the winning side of that deal, making sure that Trenton has the best, uh, the best side of it. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask another question, and we'll come back to that one further down. So this is from Ms. Edwards. Um, what factors will most determine your decision in confirming a candidate for a director or a cabinet position and why? So I'm a senior constituent services representative for Congress. I've hired dozens of interns over the past eight years and also fellow colleagues well, individually and collectively, because uh, we believe in getting everyone in the office who's gonna work with this individual's input on the process. So we vet them based on their experience, but we look for qualities like integrity, constituent services, communication skills, writing skills, but that main piece is communication. Mm -hmm. Are they going to listen to the people? Are they going to represent them properly? Um, are they going to be out in the community to know what's going on so that they're making the right decisions? So what I look for is, first and foremost, a Trentonian, someone that knows our city that's out here in the community speaking to people all the time. Because, I mean, I don't have a stranger danger mentality. If we don't have the talent here by chance, then by all means, okay, let's look elsewhere and have them move into the city eventually. But we have a lot of talent here, and I think our main thing is communication, a fair and open process to find and vet these individuals that are right here in the city. So looking for someone that is connected, that has their heart, you know, in the city, that's vested here, that cares about the future, that's working towards it in their life actively, you know, um, and then just bring them in from a different municipality because we didn't look good enough here. So I'm looking for someone that cares about the city when I'm looking, you know, at who is going to lead these different departments. Thank you. Um, Mr. Anderson, the question will be, we're on the same topic, what factors will most determine your support for appointment of residents to volunteer boards, commissions, authorities, and why?
I believe that whatever discipline or areas that you hire someone, they must have some form of expertise and knowledge in that degree. I also believe that when you do hire a person to fit into a different administration, they do need to be trained in that administration also. So I, would, I myself, I would advise the mayor that they should set up some training process for these new executives to be trained to be familiarize themselves to the city. I believe that Trenton, Trentonians are very re resilient and they have the ability to be as good as anyone else. So we should look to ourselves first, look in our midst first, to find someone from our community so we can motivate them, stimulate them, and hire them first to lead our people and to motivate our youths. Because it's, it's, it's very rewarding when you see someone who you know in a position and say, well, if he does it, I can do it too. And that's why you would like to hire someone from Trenton so it can motivate Trentonians. Thank you. So the factors that would determine my appointment, my say so, right. to the residents, to the board, my appointment. support of it, yeah. um, to the boards and why. While I do believe that people should have a basic <coughs> knowledge of the board that they're looking to be appointed to, I do also believe that people deserve the opportunity to grow and learn. I'm an educator by profession, and so for me, you know, we can look outside the box and it's okay if the person has the drive and the gumption to want to do better. I've listened to her people talk in the community who actually rent um, apartments that are not satisfied with the things that are going on where they live, and they would be interested in serving on the housing authority, right? And so why not give them the opportunity to do it? If you have the heart to do it, if you have the wherewithal, the desire to want to do it. Because again, like you said, these are volunteer positions. So people are going to take time out, right? And through conversation, we get to find out exactly what the person is about. Conversation, you kind of check back and see, you know, what, what your resume look like. Right? And so we would look, for me personally, having had that corporate background, we would look at the resume and see, what is your job longevity period? How do you move? Are you bouncing all over the place? Are you secure with where you are? Right? Are you reliable? Those things are all important because the business of the city is important. And so while we want to give residents the opportunity to serve um, the city, we also want to make sure that we put people in position that are going to be in it for real for the long haul and that they're going to do what it is that they are commissioned to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the last question on this round will be um, a repeat. What factors will most determine your decision in confirming a candidate for a director or a cabinet position? Okay, thank you for that question. So um, that would go with... Um, just doing a thorough check on one, their qualifications, um, do they meet those requirements, um, their experience, background experience. I would also think that um, the dialogue and making sure that they have certain qualities and their commitment to the city. Um, oftentimes I see that we may, you know, put someone in a position who has, who has no knowledge of this area, um, who comes into the city for a title and oftentimes they are not committed to the citizens and the residents here in the city of Trenton. So um, one, the qualifications, experience, and like I said, commitment to the city, I wanna make sure I don't do, and just, you know, their characteristics and character as, a, as an individual, <coughs> excuse me, and um, <clears throat> as an individual and as a professional. I'm um, just taking a look at their experiences and their background. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> All right, the next um, group of questions are uh, sent around reviewing and approving the proposed budget and monitoring its implementation. Um, I think one person said last night that the budget it reflects our priority. And um, with that in mind, I will start with you. Okay? <laughs> Thank you for that. familiar are you with the city's budget and how 
case developed and reviewed? There's two parts. What concern, if any, do you have about the plan? Um, first, is that, is that for me first? Yes, okay. first. Thank you for that question. Um, if I understood the question, um, for me, it always is, is who do we value and how do we demonstrate our budget to reflect who we uh, value most? Do we truly value our people or do we not value people? And how do we allocate those funds appropriately to the areas that are needed most? So that to me comes with a um, direct, in-depth conversation with some of, with our administration um, so that we can identify those key areas, be able to um, see where they're spending um, where there's unnecessary spending, where there's ways that we can save money. The ultimate goal is for Trenton to be a sustainable city. So we need to look at this, uh, the budget um, in, in depth um, and actually have a consistent dialogue with the administration so that we can identify those ways. And um, as we all know, it's been, one, we haven't had a working budget um, this current year until I think, I don't even think if it's approved yet, officially, but um, that's the most important thing. So we shouldn't have anyone interfering with the budget if that's the main primary responsibility and duty of a council person. And so I would say that just the communication with the administration and partner and working with them to identify those key areas that need to be increased or decreased so that we can effectively address the issues and needs of our city. Um, okay. yeah. um, I agree with what uh, Ms. Gonzalez said. Um, for the most part, um, myself, I'm very familiar with the budget. I work at a privately owned CPA firm. I manage the budget for two of our largest um, national TMRGs, we call them TMRGs, team member resource groups, so I manage that spending. Um, but I think one of the issues that I early um, identified with the budget is we've got directors in place who don't know how to make a budget. That is also key. So that goes back to the first question you asked me last round. Um, making sure folks that we hire know how to create a budget. And if they don't, have a business administrator in place that can teach them. We don't, we're not looking for, like any other position, anyone to be perfect. No one's perfect, but at least know where to find the information. Budgets should not be made in council meetings. Um, I strongly believe that. It should be made prior to and approved in council meetings. Um, and in you know years past, the talent just wasn't there. Uh, that's one of the primary issues, but to go back to what Ms. Gonzalez said, that, that's an easy fix. You've got two, four, five people here running for three seats. And I know that when I speak, I speak for all of us, we all want to work collectively if we're lucky enough to get one of those seats to work with the administration and support them in any way. And sometimes that support may be saying, hey, look brother, you sent me a budget and it's not really a budget, but let's work on it together. Right. This is how we can move forward. So to that point, I agree with what Ms. Gonzalez said. But those are just some issues that I see and solutions that I would bring to the table. Thank you. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the budget is prepared by the mayor with the assistant of the business administrator. So you asked what I knew about right, the budget. <laughs> $227 million is a lot of money to be working with throughout the city. Um, it is important that the directors, again, have a plan for what it is that they're looking to accomplish and have their budget in place. So the mayor, the business administrator sits with the directors, they flush it out and they figure it out. And then it comes before council to have the conversation. Areas of concern for me would be to look in key areas such as administrative fees. I mean, you know, there's places that we can put dollars for different things. Having been, uh, over 25 years of audit and investigation in my background, I would definitely have my eye on the budget to make sure that the allocations are going where they should go. Another thing is we get grant monies. I would just be curious to know how much of the grant monies for projects that we had were actually used towards completing some of the projects and how much money have we given back or have not properly even utilized at all, yet we continue to look for more money or try to say we don't have money when maybe we do, we just have not utilized it properly. And so I think that it is important, again, with my background, with my platform around revitalization, accountability, that is very important, and that falls with that, right? Fiscal responsibility for the administration, holding the directors accountable, to Kaja's point, to Yaz's point, hiring people that know what it is they're doing that are going to be here for the long haul and not just here for the paycheck. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Anderson? <clears throat> 
it is my hope that the mayor would hire the right people to do the budget. The budget is something that is set in place in every city. And I believe that the, 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 the blueprint of budget is already set. So all we have to do is make sure there's transparency and accountability for the budgets. And of course, that's what the council is there to look for, transparency and accountability for the budget. But the mayor is the <clears throat> sole person that is responsible for that duties. We're just there to make sure there's transparency and accountability for everything. Okay. Thank you. Like you said earlier, our, our budget reflects our priorities. The needs of the community is our priorities. Um, what's missing is our priorities. We should be putting money towards making things better. So the budget process goes, once we get the projected income from our different revenue streams like Trenton Waterworks, state aid, um, parking meters, fines and things like that through the court system, other municipal miscellaneous uh, fees that we get revenue from besides our property taxes, um, grants and things like that, bonds. So once the, all of that revenue is accounted for and broken down to the departments, the department directors come up with a plan on how they're going to allocate that money. So for example, we've been talking about the gun violence in our city for 20 years. And everyone keeps on saying we need the youth involved. They need things to do. Take what Parks and Recreation did, how they allocated their fund and funds into neighborhood watches, movie nights under the stars, all kinds of recreational activities for adults and kids alike. We had zero gun deaths for 60 days during that stretch of activities during the summer. And the moment those activities stopped because of the weather, the gun violence started back up. That's our priorities, is making sure that those services continue year round, making sure that our funds are being allocated to giving safe havens for our communities. So we need community centers, we need libraries. Open the schools, they're already tax exempt, they're already paid for, we don't really have to pay for too much overhead. Open them up for our kids to have somewhere safe to go. So um, we, our issue is um, not the lack of funds, it's just how we allocate them and the fact that we don't use them. So Parks and Recreations have $11 million right now that they can't get past council for approval. That's what we can do on city council is making sure that we're spending the money to save our kids. Thanks, Rich. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to continue with that thought and um, with the question, you know, what does your ideal budget process look like? From the standpoint, how would you use the budget process to promote equity across the city? Because folks look in one area and they think spending's happening over here, but spending's not happening over here. But if it's um, put out through the budget and explained to the people through the budget and they can see how things are being spent through the budget, maybe we can have a sense of equity and unity across the city. So um, we will start with, um, maybe I'll go in the middle <laughs> and mix it up. <laughs> um, why don't we start with Mr. Anderson? I know you said the budget is set, but we'd like to hear some thoughts about, in the process of that set budget, how would you look at a budget and say, we have equity across the city when we're looking at our budget? <clears throat> okay. Again, like I said, um, I am the chairman of the Board of Commissioners at the Housing Authority. The Housing Authority has a budget similar to the city, the city budget. And our, um, our director presents the budget to us on a timely basis. And yes, we, we would be able to analyze the budget, see in what department 
That is, um, make sure we, we have transparency and accountability and see where the mayor is presenting to us areas where it, it is profitable to the city. And then we can work on those areas to make sure that the budget money is spent in the right places. Thank you. Ms. Gonzalez. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that question. Could you just repeat it, though, one more time? Sure, sure. Um, so it's around your ideal budget process, but at the same time, how would you use the budget process to promote equity across the city? Um, thank you for that question. So one, I would say um, just being transparent um, with the community and allowing the community to be included in the, the, the budget process is obviously an administrative and council and, and, you know, we all take a look at it, but also involving the community to be a part of it to see um, where they where they feel they are not being um, their needs are not being met also. Um, and so I would say, um, you know, creating some type of session. I know our, our meetings, council meetings are open to the public, but unfortunately some people are not on Zoom. Maybe in person we can allot some time so that the community is able to come in and be a part of that process as well. And just be informed. They can ask the questions. Um, oftentimes they don't feel included in any of the process. And I believe as elected officials we are working for the people, so allow them to be a part of the conversation and a part of their um, the process and have input also. And where our uh, funds are being allocated. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> Me? Yes, you. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, how do we use the, the budget process to make sure that equity is across the city? is the question. Thank you. All right, so on my platform, the last E in the word race, right, for me, we, we say that our platform is based around the word race, revitalization, accountability, collaboration, and equity for all. So in looking at the budget process, when the directors come forward with their plans and everything, I would suggest in order to have community involvement, like the thing is, City Hall is never going to open up the doors and be like, tell me all your thoughts and tell me everything that you need and everything that you want. We would have total melee. <laughs> if that happened, right? It can't, it just won't be. So what they can do is have surveys, right? We've sent out survey, ask the questions. What are your concerns? Even looking through GovPilot, they have certain things in place. What has been reported? What are issues that are going on? What is happening and how can we fix what is going on around us? We have different departments, public works, housing and economic development, recreation, water, health and human services, police and fire. Everybody should be coming to the table with something viable for what's going to happen in this city. And so then based on information that has been gathered and basic needs, because the thing is, Every department director has people that work for them that are supposed to be out and about seeing what's going on. They should have a pulse for what's going on in this city, right? And it shouldn't be sometimes. It should be all the time. People should know what is happening. And so when it's time to sit and make the budget, then they will be able to properly allocate the funding to say, housing and economic development needs this, public works is going to do this, and then the hope would be that by, by spreading the money the right way through the different departments, one thing, by fixing one thing, it would help eliminate another thing and another thing. And so everybody is working together collaboratively and cohesively in order to make things better. Thank you. How would I use the budget process to make sure there's equity across the city? Mm -hmm. um, equity. Accessibility. Accessibility to not just learning what the information is, learning what our resources are, but access to health care, like how the Department of Health had opened up the, the clinic on Olden Avenue, making sure that as our hospitals are shutting down, that we still are providing resources. How they added mental health services to the department because we know that we are an impoverished city <coughs> where we have concentrated poverty here at 40% below poverty line. 75% low income, these are the facts. So we need, we know people need help out here. So healthcare, um, education, transportation, whether it be public, whether it's transportation for our seniors, whether it's transportation for our children to get to school. We know that South Trenton, South Ward, has a huge transportation issue right mm -hmm. now for their students to get across town with the mm -hmm. new redistricting plan. So our students are left to walk for 
miles just to get to school from the South Ward because of the redistricting. Um, revitalization with our housing market. To when we talk about equity, let's talk about the tax burden that are on the taxpayers that are in the city. When we have hundreds, thousands of properties that we're not collecting tax from, taxes from, the burden falls on other people. So then where's the fairness in that? So we have to focus on returning properties to the tax roll, getting tax rateables from our non-tax or our non uh, tax paying properties in the city mm -hmm. so that our taxpayers don't feel that <clears throat> burden. You know, um, homelessness, our seniors, that's equity. Making sure that they have access to the resources they need, the information they need. Um, and uh, that's about it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I pretty much describe what equity is. So just making sure that everyone has access to everything they need across the board. And you feel that can be done through the budget? Yes. <laughs> through the budget, yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, while I feel I agree with everyone here on this panel, I, I think they pretty much, for the most part, have uh, maximized the value mm -hmm. of uh, contributions anyone can say, but I will say this. Um, a budget is a moral document, and like Jossie said, she hit it right on the, right on the money. Um, the budget reflects what the administration and what the directors say is important to them. Um, but as an at-large council person, I can't be everywhere at once. No one can be anywhere at once. So I have to really rely and forge some relationships. Um, if the current administration stays on, get, you know, lace your boots up and get down in the streets with, with the actual directors. But I'd also lean on my fellow council members who aren't at large. Um, we see some, some candidates are in here. For example, Jenna's there. If I really want to know what's going on in the South Ward, I will look to the administration, but also I'm going to ask Jenna, you know, during my uh, office hours, and I say office hours because I have a pretty flexible job, I'm fortunate, um, something that our team and I spoke about was creating maybe a two-hour window each day that I can dedicate to communication coming in and responding real time, either via in person or on Zoom, but creating an office hours. Uh, a lot of times we see, to go back to what Josh said, um, accessibility is a big issue here. A lot of folks aren't accessible. They're not in the community. They're not, they're not even on Facebook. So you can't really find them and then you'd email, shoot it in the wind, hopes to get a response 72 hours later. This time around, and I, based off their responses, we all are looking to revolutionize that. So the competition is tough. But um, <laughs> yeah, the competition is a little stiff. But um, yeah, um, accessibility, having open, uh, open office hours. Oh, is that yellow or red? Okay. Uh, having open, <laughs> open, open office hours, being accessible, but also relying on the folks and systems that are in place, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Rely on your colleagues, rely on the administration, and if something comes in that you know, even though we're serving at large, hopefully three of us will be, mm -hmm. look to where that ward is, and then also, quick, send an email. Hey, Jenna, this came in, CC the director, boom. And then allow them to use their leadership skills and their position to also handle it. You don't want to step on anyone's toes. All right, thanks for that. Yeah. Um, so this is probably the last question around that. But it's, it's kind of coming from a standpoint where citizens are asking for services that are just part of regular infrastructure that just should be maintenance. It just should be integrated in a budget. I mean, I personally have been told once I needed something done, it still hasn't been done. And they're like, well, they're trying to budget. And I'm like, okay, well, when are you getting the budget? And it's been two years. I don't know if it's ever, ever been getting the budget. So, Given that type of um, attitude towards we can't do this because it's not in the budget, that wasn't budgeted for, what, <coughs> if anything, would be a, a good ongoing budget review process to kind of um, validate that the budgets that were presented that would create the equity is being implemented in um, the schedule or in the fashion of some metrics and standard of operating procedures been established, what would you want to see as you um, monitor um, the implementation of the budget? Oh, I should pick someone. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gonzalez. Yes, ma'am. Um, what would I want to 
see implemented in the budget? And, and kind of an ongoing review process, you know, so that you, as a as part of your role in monitoring the implementation of the budget, mm -hmm. what would you want to see to kind of um, give you a sense that the budget is doing what it's done? Um, I would say that would come with accountability and also just um, more consistent line of communication with um, department heads, administration, um, to take a take a good look at what is being spent, what's not being spent, and um, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> what what we, where can we save money? Where can we address certain issues? Um, as as I stated earlier, are we invested in certain areas where, as we know, poverty drives our crime rates? So are we truly invested in the, in this in this area where it would help address those issues? Um, but also making sure that it's fairly, you know, it's spread across fairly. Um, and also taking advantage of some of our grant and funding that is coming into the city to help um, provide resources to our people. I am often seeing that there's um, individuals who may be in the middle class and they feel like, oh, because I make a certain amount of money, I can't, um, I don't qualify for certain programs that, that basically they're, meet, they're making ends meet. So they need, even though they're working class individuals, they still need assistance. They need, still need, may need, you know, two thousand dollars to help get a roof fixed that they, you know, can't get done because they are too busy working two or three jobs just to make their ends meet. So I feel like just, um, you know, just having more of a consistent communication so that we can um, evaluate the budget together collaboratively and look at what's being spent, what's not being spent. How can we save money so that we can eventually put more money in the people's pocket at the end of the day? Thank you. Um, would you like to go next? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> had a long day. I had to write the notes down. Um, Ms. Gonzalez was right on point. I think uh, in a perfect world, we'd have a tax surplus. Um, thank God for cannabis business coming into Trenton. We are going to benefit so much from that. Um, we also have to address the awkward elephant in the room, the structural deficit that the state's imposed on us. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't get dollar for dollar what's owed, residents and taxpayers, or excuse me, property owners, we'll keep foot in the bill. Yes, we get $20 million, but if we got dollar for dollar, we'd be getting 45. And homeowners like myself, like many of you in here, we foot that bill. So my team and I, we looked at innovative ways to address that if the state won't give us our money, creating a commuter tax. And I say commuter tax and not city tax, like most, almost every capital city in the, in the country has a city tax. But I called it a commuter tax and we'll, you know, hopefully look at ways to implement this because this, the residents are already footing the bill. Why double tax them? Mm -hmm. um, but I think if the state's not giving us our money, we should take it by way of a commuter tax, create a tax surplus, um, and then we can do great things like Gasminelli said. If things aren't in the budget, we have a surplus. Apply some of this money to a program that needs it or to a resident that needs it. Hopefully, you know, this, this next election is going to make or break this town. I honestly do believe that. That's why this is so important. And that's why we all showed up. And that's why you all showed up. But um, we want a tax surplus. And that's, we can only get that from taking it. And thank God to the, to the cannabis industry coming here and investing in town. And that will truly start to um, show Trenton what equity really is. You know, equity isn't equality. Equity is the, you know, the access to mm. opportunity, which creates equality. But, um, make me nervous, Michelle. <laughs> but, but yeah, and when we get a tax surplus, we can put money aside to help those on fixed incomes with the rising cost of taxes. And hopefully taxes will decrease. I always think about retirees, seniors, and disabled you know, veterans, and so on and so on. But a tax surplus will fix that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> So you asked about what would be an ongoing review mm -hmm. of the budget. What would I want to see as far as an ongoing review? What we would want to see is an ongoing review of the budget. So that, again, is what they've said about the conversations, right? What, what plans have been put forward? What has been executed um, within the different departments? What have they done? And we stop and we take a moment and take pause to say, what can we do? to help make it look better. So does that look like every six months you just kind of take a cursory review and just see where we are and what needs to be done? Does that look like, you know, quarterly? Are we looking? But something needs to be looked at closer, right? We look at the, um, the 250 plan, 
And this beautiful plan was put together, paid for, put together for what Trenton is supposed to evolve to be by 2042. Where are we even with the plan? We, we have this document, a living, breathing Bible document, that talks about seven principles that it was based on, that Trenton was going to grow and rise and thrive and be excellent in so many areas. Well, when do we start stopping to make sure that we're moving in that direction that we're supposed to be moving? Otherwise, again, we've shelled out more money for nothing. Thank you. As, as we know, budgets are set, and the budget is set by the city. And you're saying that setting up a, an ongoing review for the budget is what the question is, right? It's more an ongoing review of the implementation of the budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. An ongoing review. I'll, I, I would say if we put together... Uh, if we put together a department that can oversee the budget and to make sure that there's transparency in the budget where we can analyze the budget, whatever we have in the city where, where there is where, where there is um, I would say as I just, just said we have excess excess like the water department that makes uh, excess in their budget, we can use that money to balance over with the budget and, and, and help other departments and the citizens to be beneficiary to those avenues. Can I just say to that? Yeah. Okay. To that point, we have a business administrator that is in place that works with the mayor to set the budget and working with the department directors, right, to ensure that things are done as they are supposed to be. And that's where that accountability comes into play and those conversations come into play to hold people accountable, which is why it's important that when we put directors into position that we hire people that are capable of fulfilling the job requirements and getting it done. Right, so then that way when we have those checkpoints to just say, what have you implemented? That also will go into our review of these candidates that we said go ahead and hire them, right? So we need to make sure that everybody is doing what they're supposed to do. The business administrator is supposed to be overseeing what's going on. He helps set the budget, that's what we have him and we pay him for or her. The, the, everyone needs to do their job to make sure that Trent gets its fair share. Thank you. All right, so you may Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, please. You want to answer that? Oh, quickly. Yeah, quickly. I'm so sorry. No worries, no worries. Timer. What would I want to see as I monitor the budget? That was the question. Yes. Um, and with the implementation specifically, I would like to see a little bit of transparency. I would like to see community input. Um, we blame council for a lot of things, but I think that the administration can do better too, and the mayor recognizes that, um, as a good leader should recognize their flaws and work with them, right? So town halls, we should be reaching out to the constituents to see what their needs are in the community um, and implementing the things that we do need. Uh, some things that I see that are missing from the budget that I think should be in there are more things in the school budget. So we have a surplus. Where is this money going? That's what I would like to know first and foremost. When we have a surplus, where is that, that money allocated towards? And can it be allocated towards our education to get more transportation for kids, to, have, uh, to provide field trips for them as well? Um, a lot of the issues that we see here is because our kids are stuck in the city mm -hmm. and they're not exposed to different cultures, different environments. They're not exposed to better. Uh, when I'm out canvassing on my campaign, I take high schoolers with me. And I took them to Hill 20 last week. 
and you know they thought we entered a different municipality. So They're like, where are we? And this guy answered the door. Mind you, I have African-American kids from Wilbur section. And, and um, you know, a guy answered the door. And he goes, wait, let me go get my mother-in-law so that she can hear what you have to say. And he left this door open. And he's like, wait, they trust us? <laughs> Just getting them out of their environment and seeing how other people interact with one another, see how their properties are kept, how nice their homes are, just simple quality of life, things like that. And then you get into the education of history, economics, all of these things that benefit their minds every day, and then they're gonna come back to their community, and then their minds are gonna be turning about how they can make our environment better. I know because those are my experiences. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Thank <laughs> you. 